Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to introduce this year's Peter Safer Memorial Lecture being presented by Dr. Daniel Talmor. Dr. Talmor is the chair of the Department of Anesthesia, Critical Care, and Pain Medicine at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and the Edward Launstein Professor of Anesthesia at Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts. He's a long time contributor to the Society of Critical Care Medicine. Dr. Talmor's research interests are centered on the early identification and treatment of critical ill patients, with a particular focus on the optimal delivery of mechanical ventilation. He has published over 200 peer review papers, as well as multiple book chapters, editorials, and abstracts, and has lectured extensively around the world. Dr. Talmor has served as principal investigator on a number of national, lung, and blood institute-funded studies, and is currently an investigator in the NHLBI network for the prevention and treatment of acute lung injury. Today, Dr. Talmor will present the lecture, ARDS will precision approaches move the needle and will be available for live questions and answer session immediately following this presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Daniel Talmor. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining me. I'd also like to thank the organizers of the conference for inviting me to give the Peter Safar Memorial Lecture. My name's Danny Talmor from uh, Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston. Before I begin, I'll say that I have um, no really relevant um, conflicts of interest to this talk other than I have a lot of opinions and I'll be stating them during the talk. Now, um, I think it's um, fitting to acknowledge the times we live in right now. And I think back um, to this book, The Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens, and what is maybe the greatest first chap first paragraph in any book in the English language. It's the best of times and the worst of times, the age of wisdom and the age of foolishness. And we as critical care physicians are, are living all of that. We're living the worst of times. We're seeing hundreds of patients in our ICUs, um, extremely sick. But on the other hand, it's the best of times. This is the time when everything we've learned and trained for in our entire careers is coming to bear, when we are, are as valued um, as, as could possibly be by society and have facing an intellectual um, challenge like none other. And um, at the center of that challenge is really our old um, friend, ARDS, um, COVID-19 manifests itself in acute respiratory distress syndrome. This is a disease that's been around for more than 50 years, one that we've battled with often, and um, one in which we're making great progress. And I'd like to describe some of that progress to you today. And I think it's um, always important to remember where we came from. And in the beginning, in um, ARDS, we focused on restoration of normal oxygen and CO2 levels. So this was our initial treatment um, modality for, the, for mechanically ventilated patients. And it was based on, on um, studies, uh, published studies, the excellent studies for their time. For example, this one in the New England Journal in 1963, which demonstrated that patients under anesthesia faced a large drop in their oxygenation, um, but that using continuous large tidal volumes or periodic deep breaths, hyperinflations, we can prevent the increase in the variable shunt, that is atelectasis, that is hypoxemia. And really this was our approach to um, mechanical ventilation for over 30 years. We um, delivered high tidal volumes in an attempt to maintain normal oxygenation. That, that was reinforced after um, ARDS was first described in this paper um, in chess by Tom Petty and David Ashbaugh, the um, people who first described ARDS. They had learned that high tidal volume ventilation with both inspiratory plateau and positive end expiratory pressure improves oxygen transport across the lung. 
So this is the state of knowledge really until the mid 1980s. At that time, we became more aware of the importance of preventing ventilator induced lung injury. Um, multiple smart critical care physicians began to describe how the ventilator itself can injure the lung and actually exacerbate the ARDS. And how, how was that treated? Um, so this is the famous, um, famous graph from the ARDSnet low tidal volume study showing an improved outcome when patients are ventilated with lower tidal volumes rather than higher tidal volumes. So here we begin to shift our paradigm from obtaining normal numbers to preventing further injury. And this, this um, paper was actually controversial at the time, if, if you remember, in that um, it did not, the, the um, use of one size ventilation for everyone um, seemed to be against the way physicians actually practiced. And in this um, very interesting editorial from Critical Care Medicine in 2005, inve investigators looked at the mortality among patients in the ARDSnet trial who were excluded for various reasons. And they found that the patients who were excluded from the trial actually had the same mortality as those randomized to the 6 mLs per kilo tidal volume. That the mortality in the 12 mLs per kilogram tidal volume um, group was much higher. So this led them to conclude that, that the trial was flawed in that it allowed, it allowed the clinicians in the trial to apply only one of two tidal volumes, and that this was very different from what clinicians do in practice. They found that when patients with, um, who had a lower pulmonary compliance were randomized to a higher tidal volume, randomized to the 12 mLs per kilogram group, they had an increased mortality rate. On the other hand, those with better compliance randomized to the lower group had an increased mortality rate. So by eliminating any variability, we actually increased mortality in both groups. And um, this lesson was, was um, reinforced to us uh, a couple of years ago in the LungSafe trial, a large survey of mechanical ventilation around the world. It found that um, clinicians weren't necessarily using 6 mLs per kilo tidal volume in patients with ARDS. In fact, many patients had more than 8 mLs per kilo of tidal volume. So the question was, and the question raised at the time of the paper, are these clinicians just ill-informed? Are they making a mistake? Are they inappropriately treating their patients with low tidal volumes, with, with higher tidal volumes? And in fact, maybe this represents clinician wisdom and rejects the one-size-fits-all solution to tidal volume. So while focusing on the reduction of ventilator-induced lung injury, perhaps we were bringing on um, other problems. And the same could be said perhaps for PEEP trials. So here's a summary of the major PEEP trials in the literature, all of which were negative, um, except for the ART trial, which showed, seemed to show harm from higher PEEP. But all of these trials were also essentially flawed because they did not take into account the individual variability of the patients. If you look at um, what happens when we increase a patient from a lower PEEP to a higher PEEP, we increase the plateau pressure, and um, we may or may not be benefiting the patient. And when we randomly increase the um, PEEP in patients, we don't know if that patient is recruitable or not. We don't know if they can possibly benefit from a higher level of PEEP. So among those patients in whom PEEP is increased, there will be some who are non-recruitable. And in those patients, increasing PEEP will increase the plateau pressure, increase the driving pressure, and likely the injury from PEEP will outweigh the benefit. On the other hand, there are recruitable patients in that study, patients in whom increasing PEEP recruits lung, plateau pressure doesn't necessarily increase, and driving pressure will go down. In those patients, the benefit outweighs the injury. And um, by recruiting patients, by, by applying empiric peak to patients, we may be 
um, applying it to those who could possibly benefit and those who could possibly be injured. One way to individualize the response to PEEP is to use the concept of transpulmonary pressure, the actual distending pressure of the lung. To remind people that transpulmonary pressure is the airway minus the pleural pressure, and that can be elucidated using an esophageal balloon. The transpulmonary pressure, as we showed in this paper, may be very different from the airway pressure. And without that measurement, we cannot individualize the level of PEEP. I'll give you an example. So this is a um, this is sample data from an anesthetized obese subject, and I'm going to focus in on the area of that black line and expand out the time scale. So you can see in this patient, uh, we've disconnected the patient from the ventilator over here. We then reconnect him and begin to inflate um, inflate the um, lung. So we're delivering pressure all along here but you can see no volume is going into the lung. In that first area, um, even though the pressure is going up, no volume is delivered. It's only when the um, pressure applied to the lung is greater than the esophageal pressure do we begin to see the volume of the lung increase. So only when we overcome the weight of the chest wall um, are we seeing a breath delivered. The same goes on the, on the um, downside. When we deflate the lung, as soon as the pressure in the lung or the PEEP decreases below the esophageal pressure, the lung will begin to collapse. So um, while we focused on prevention of ventilator-induced lung injury, we didn't necessarily do it in the smartest way. We used one-size-fits-all approaches that were neither what clinicians did in practice or what made sense from a physiologic standpoint. <clears throat> Over the last decade, more attention has been pay paid to patient self-induced lung injury, the risks of spontaneous ventilation, and the risk to the diaphragm. Now, spontaneous ventilation is uh, obviously necessary. This doesn't work moving directly from controlled mechanical ventilation to extubated. We need a middle step of spontaneous ventilation. So we have to learn how to use spontaneous ventilation in the smartest way. We need to learn how to bring the patient into the best possible synchrony with the ventilator. And dyssynchrony can be deadly. I'd like to show you again on these, um, these tracings what the effect of dyssynchrony can be on tidal volume and transpulmonary pressure. So if you look um, in this area here, and top, there is the airway pressure, and you can see the patient is getting a delivered breath there. But down here, the patient is also taking a spontaneous breath. So on the esophageal pressure, pressure taste tracing, you can see um, an inflection, a decrease in esophageal pressure, which indicates the patient is taking a spontaneous breath. What happens then? The airway pressure increases as that spontaneous breath stacks on top of the ventilator delivered breath, that leads to an increase in volume and an increase in transpulmonary pressure, both of which can be injurious to the lung. So dyssynchrony, spontaneous ventilation, um, not in sync with the patient's ventilator pattern can be extremely dangerous. I'll show you a second um, example here. So this is a patient under, um, under APRV ventilation. You can see on top the airway tracing. You can see the on the second line the esophageal pressure tracing. The patient is taking large breaths on top of their APRV. And that's leading to very large transpulmonary pressure. So the transpulmonary pressure measured on this patient was greater than 35 centimeters of water. That's a highly injurious level of transpulmonary pressure as this patient breathes spontaneously on the high um, plateau levels of APRV. When we look at what that does to the volume delivered, those, those um, spontaneous breaths can lead to tidal volumes of um, greater, much greater than 10 mLs per kilo. So spontaneous ventilation over delivered mechanical ventilation called dyssynchrony can be extremely dangerous. <clears throat> 
And that's been demonstrated in a number of studies which have, have shown the um, relationship between um, dyssynchrony and mortality. So here, um, this, this um, study by Louise Blanche showed that when the asynchrony index was greater than 10%, so more than, than 10, um, 10 um, dyssynchronous breaths, um, you can see that the mortality was increased, ICU mortality um, greater than 50% in these patients. <clears throat> On the flip side, um, lack of spontaneous breathing can lead to atrophy of the diaphragmatic muscles. And this is an area where we've paid a lot more attention in recent years. So this um, very interesting study by Ewan Golliger showed that patients under mechanical ventilation had a decrease in their diaphragmatic thickness over the first eight days of mechanical ventilation. Now, some patients actually had an increase in diaphragmatic thickness, and those were the patients in whom, um, in whom the, who continued to have spontaneous ventilation and make inspiratory efforts during the ventilation. So this would indicate that some patients actually benefit from reduced support, greater degrees of spontaneous ventilation, and their diaphragm is preserved. <clears throat> now, how do we square this? Um, this is an extremely interesting study by um, Takeshi Yoshida, where he took patients with two levels of injury, mild and severe, and uh, animals with two levels of injury, mild and severe, and then allowed them either to have spontaneous breathing or no spontaneous breathing. And you can see from his results that those who were mildly injured, who had no spontaneous breathing, were actually did worse than those who were allowed to breathe spontaneous. On the other hand, those with a more severe injury did better if they had no, um, if they were not allowed to breathe spontaneously. So maybe that's the answer. As we individualize our level of ventilation, we individualize our control of spontaneous ventilation to those who are more severely injured. <clears throat> so having focused on prevention of ventilator-induced lung injury, um, reduction of patient self-induced lung injury, the, the risk to the diaphragm, we arrive to our current understanding of, of ventilation for ARDS that there are phenotypes of disease based upon mechanics, clinical factors, and imaging that we can use to personalize our mechanical ventilation. And first, um, we have to acknowledge that ARDS is a heterogeneous disease. We, we've known that all along. And really, um, that even accentuates the need to personalize ventilation based on the patient's factors and the disease factors um, contributing to that patient's mechanical ventilation. I'd like to show you an example of individualization in practice. Um, this is a patient from our ICU with um, moderate ARDS from trolley and aspiration. We ventilated this patient at three levels of PEEP. So first on a level of a PEEP of six, um, we measured the patient's pulmonary mechanics. We looked at their esophageal pressure and their airway pressure, and we calculated from those the transpulmonary pressures. So this patient on a PEEP of six had a um, low compliance of 14 centimeters of water, a high driving pressure of 18 centimeters of water, and that was explained by a um, negative transpulmonary pressure at, exp at expiration. So this patient was collapsing after every breath. And by allowing them to collapse, we decreased the compliance and the driving pressure went up. When we examined this same patient on a PEEP of 18, um, empiric PEEP of 18, the patient's driving pressure was even higher, the compliance was the same, and the transpulmonary pressure was now very positive, positive six. So we can overdistend the lung by increasing PEEP. But only by using the patient's individualized um, mechanics can we choose the optimal level of PEEP, and in this case, it was 12. When we pay, placed the patient on a PEEP, which gave them an end expiratory transpulmonary pressure of, of approximately zero, we achieved the optimal driving pressure, 15 in this case, and the better compliance, 18. <clears throat> 
So this is, this is individualization in practice. And we've shown, and this is a study under review, so, so you won't have seen it before. We've shown using data from our EPVENT2 trial that patients who were maintained with a transpulmonary pressure of plus or minus two centimeters of water did those did better, um, had a better survival than those in whom the transpulmonary pressure was either higher or lower. So maintaining a transpulmonary pressure in that optimal range of zero led to an improved survival in patients with ARDS. <clears throat> that shows us how to deal with PEEP and oxygenation. Dysynchrony is a more difficult problem. We know that clinicians are not good at recognizing dysynchrony. It can be extremely difficult based on, um, on observation of respiratory tracings. So the individualization of treatment for dysynchrony probably lies in automation. And um, this is data from uh, my colleague Elias bedorf cassis showing automated detection of various patterns of dysynchrony. And the way this will eventually integrate into a ventilator is using neural networks and pattern recognition to find and identify different phenotypes of dysynchrony and then suggest modifications to the ventilator settings in order to eliminate those dysynchronies. <clears throat> Beyond the ventilator itself, uh, we'll see enhanced use of imaging. Now, we're all very familiar with studies of, of use of CT scans in ARDS. And that led to a, um, that led to a significant um, improvement in our understanding of ARDS. The entire concept of baby lungs and ventilating baby lungs comes from these CAT scan studies. Unfortunately, CT scanning is not practical at the bedside, and it's uh, extremely difficult, at least in the United States, to move a patient to the CAT scanner for a diagnostic study. <coughs> um, CT scanning was um, Re, we refocused on CT scanning um, during the COVID epidemic. So this is data from Dr. Gattinoni demonstrating the, um, the low and high type uh, phenotypes of COVID ARDS. So um, the low was low, um, was high com highly compliant lungs. The H type was um, very non-compliant lungs and um, he differentiated these as needing different types of mechanical ventilation. But we can have a, do have a bedside modality, and um, that's EIT. Now, EIT, I've you know, been to, of course, many critical care meetings. It always seemed to be just around the corner, but it is actually here. Um, bedside EIT machines are available. Um, we can use them, and we can use them to assess um, ventilation and perfusion in, the, in patients with ARDS. And in fact, we know that EIT has excellent correlation with CAT scan studies. We can view the um, ventilated and perfused areas of the lung. We can identify areas of collapse and over distension. And here you can see um, that using EIT, they've been able to identify the optimal PEEP, which minimizes over distension and maximizes um, and, and minimizes collapse. So if we have a PEEP lower than 10, we see an increase in collapse. If we have a PEEP higher than 10, an increase in over distension. And at a PEEP of 10, we see the maximum compliance of the lung. This is something you can do at the bedside using, um, using EIT imaging. And as I say, it is here. Finally, um, we should recognize that different phenotypes of ARDS can be identified using biomarkers. And um, biomarkers have been measured, of course, in ARDS for years, but we haven't um, exactly understood how to use them. And um, great progress has been made over the last 10 years in identifying biomarkers associated with hypo and hyperinflammatory ARDS. And this is a paper by Sinha in intensive care medicine a few years ago showing the biomarkers 
and associated with hyperinflammatory ARDS here and with and those associated with hypoinflammatory ARDS here. So using latent class analysis of these biomarkers, it's possible to identify um, patients who are at higher risk of mortality with the hyperinflammatory subphenotype or those at risk, those with hypoinflammatory ARDS with a lower risk of mortality. So biomarkers, again, measured for years, but something that we're just understanding how to use. Using these phenotypes of the hyperinflammatory and hypoinflammatory subgroups of ARDS, we can then go back and look at the results of clinical trials um, that had previously been done in heterogeneous populations. So this is a reanalysis of the data from the HARP study, which tested the use of simvastatin in patients with ARDS. So you can see here that this study was overall negative. And if you look at the hypoinflammatory patients, there was absolutely no difference in their outcome. However, if you take the hyperinflammatory patients, you can see that those who received simvastatin had a better outcome than those who did not. And that outcome, um, that improvement in survival was consistent out to 90 days. So again, this shows us that taking large trials in heterogeneous populations does not make sense in the era in which we can individualize our treatment to specific population sets, positive trial. So use of biomarkers um, can lead to a strategy of enrichment of clinical trials. And um, enriching our clinical trials using pulmonary mechanics, imaging, and um, selective use of biomarkers can lead to smarter trials um, trials that are more likely to succeed and trials that are more likely to target um, the appropriate patients. And I'm sure like all of you, um, I'm sick of negative trials in ARDS. And the solution is not to use, um, to power through and just recruit larger numbers. The solution is to be smarter about who we recruit into our clinical trials. So um, beyond the clinical trial, taking it to the bedside, using um, imaging, um, in particular ultrasound and EIT, using pulmonary mechanics um, measured at the bedside, um, esophageal manometry, compliance of the lung, driving pressure of the lung, um, using smart ventilators, which can um, assess dyssynchrony and help us deal with that. And finally, biomarkers, will allow us to develop an integrated approach for prospective decision making in our patients with ARDS and improve outcome in those patients. And finally, taking that personalized mechanical ventilation, uh, personalized phenotyping of our patients, we should be able to develop fully automated mechanical ventilation. And again, this is something that we've been hearing for years, it's just around the corner but I really believe it is. And um, the ventilator companies are beginning to um, bring these modalities to market to um, develop the first um, prototypes of closed loop ventilation. They, um, they have been tested in Europe. We have not yet tested them here in the United States, but it is here. So to sum up, personalization of mechanical ventilation using um, patient phenotypes is the wave of the future. I believe we will see it um, fully developed over the next five years. And this is an exciting time for, um, for discovery in ARDS. It's an exciting time to be a clinician in the ICU. And um, I look forward to, to seeing how all this develops. I'd be remiss if I didn't um, thank the people I work with. On, on the top left-hand side is Steve Loring, who was my mentor in pulmonary physiology. Um, the others are, are Jeremy Beitler and Elias Badorf cassis my friends and colleagues here at BIDMC, whose ideas have contributed um, much to my career and to, to my thinking on this topic. So I'd like to thank you all for listening, and I believe that after this we have an open question and answer session. Thank you very much.